Okay, so uh, we have also Philip. Hi, everybody. Philip is trying to connect. So let's wait for a second. So again, I salute you. Today we are in for a treat. We're going to be together for four periods. Two for the needs of 790, your course, finite element uh, method, right? And uh, SIK790. And of course, we have our lecture later on for scene 778. I just wanted to ask you, do we have anybody that is not registered in uh, the Reinforced Concrete Design class in the course scene 778? All right. Thabizeng, did I say that correctly? Okay. Uh, anyone else other than Miss Thabizeng? Okay. And Dylan as well. Okay. So, from Hannes, uh, he asked me to offer you a lecture for the needs of this course. And uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Prof. George Marku. I'm from Cyprus. I studied at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece. And uh, my field of expertise is the finite element method. And of course, my PhD was in computational mechanics and modeling of uh, reinforced concrete structures, even though prior to that, I was involved in research uh, in the modeling of uh, the problem of fluid structure interaction. And particularly, actually, we were modeling uh, wing, wings for air, from aeroplanes, uh, the agar wing, even though I was a civil engineer. And then uh, after I finished with my PhD, I was, before I finished with my PhD, I was working for Frederick University of Cyprus as a part-timer there in the civil engineering department. And uh, thereafter, after I was done in January 2011 with my PhD, I found a job in Abu Dhabi in the UAE at al Hosan University. I was working there for six years. Then I left uh, for the UCSC. Uh, in uh, South America and Chile, actually, <laughs> that was a strange uh, and interesting time. And then I left uh, 2017, 2018, I was in the University of Sheffield in the UK as a research visitor. And after that, I went and I came and I joined our university. And uh, since September 2018, I'm, a, I'm an associate professor in our structural division class and I'm teaching uh the scene 778 and of course computer methods in civil engineering for sca 420 and uh, our research uh, my research my team's research uh, is actually in this case uh, all about modeling uh, numerical methods algorithms programming new methodologies and uh, based on the output of the research team, I'm going to show you, in this case, uh, our software and uh, implementation through that sof software referred to and related to reinforced concrete structures. And in this case, I'm going to show you uh, extreme loading, cyclic and monotonic, and we're going to see some cases uh, where we model experiments and compare the numerical results with the experimental output. Then I'm going to talk to you a bit about the uh, use of artificial intelligence algorithms um, and combination with FEM in order to develop um, models, predictive models uh, that will help us design our structures and uh, say a few things about high performance computing as well Com always the base here and the heart and this let's say the sun of the <laughs> of the universe is the finite element method and i'm sure you realize it so far by now that uh, this is a very important methodology that we use a lot in our profession in uh, 
providing answers to different problems that if we are where if we were to use analytical methodologies it would have been a disaster and i'm going to show you also at the end uh, an application that we recently managed to successfully complete which relates to bioengineering so this is uh, the table of contents what we're going to talk about and it's not going to be i assume and i hope it's not going to be a very boring presentation because I'm going to show you the fun part, which is uh, the results that derive from the use of this uh, method. So we're going to see a few things about 3D detail modeling of reinforced concrete structures. Then we're going to see advanced numerical uh, nonlinear analysis uh, under cyclic loadings. And I'm going to say a few things about the damage factor as well, and some damage factors that we proposed. And then uh, we're going to show some results uh, after we cover the basic concept of machine learning and how this is used in order to develop design formula. And then I'm going to show you the slides with some recent results on bioengineering and, of course, future work. And then we can have a discussion. We will see our time limitations. And uh, if we have the time as well, we can maybe model something perform an analysis. I was planning today, uh, not today, tomorrow or after tomorrow for our scene 778 to create a model and then apply uh, what is known as cyclic loads in, instead of just covering a monotonic load. So in this case, uh, if we're going to model something, it's going to be, um, I don't know, maybe it may be a reinforced concrete structural member, maybe a soil structure interaction problem. We'll see if we have the time to do that, then we will do it. So before we uh, continue and start with section one, do we have any questions from the students, from anyone that would like to ask something? By the way, uh, feel free to ask questions during the uh, presentation as well, given the fact that this is not an official presentation given to an audience where you expect the presenter to finish with their presentation and what they have to say and then have a, a questions and answer session. So if you have any question, if you see something that is very interesting and you want to ask something about it, then please feel free to raise your hand or type something in the chat area and I will get to it. So what is a 3D detail modeling approach? Uh, the 3D detail modeling approach uh, foresees the use of the hexahedral element. We have eight noted and 20 noted hexahedral elements incorporated in Reconan FAIR. Reconan FAIR is a software that I've developed when I was a PhD student, and now we are extending its development and giving it abilities to model different types of problems with different type of solvers, with different type, uh, type of um, finite elements and, of course, material models. Now, one might say, ah, oh, you are a structural, uh, in the structural division, doesn't matter. We do a lot of work in geotechnical engineering, soil structure interaction as well. And uh, if somebody wants to say, what about sustainable energy? We are modeling also wind turbine structures, uh, even nuclear reactor buildings and we take into consideration soil, we perform analysis on purely geotechnical problems. We have now Daniel Radman, who did a very nice work, uh, he's a Scripsy student, on piles and uh, how the pile, soil pile interaction uh, changes the stresses within the, 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 the soil domain. So this is very interesting and everything is in 3D, so it's very practical as well and provides us with the understanding of how this problem is formulated, what are the characteristics and what we need to pay attention to. And these answers uh, wouldn't be there if we didn't have these tools that we've developed and above all the finite element method. So as you can see, hexahedral elements are used in order to discretize the, the concrete domain. And within this concrete domain, we model and discretize the rebars as they are. So this is what you're looking at here. This is, these are the piers, uh, the deck and the pile cap 
uh, offering first concrete bridge. This bridge was 100 meters in span and it, was, it had an arc shape as well. So uh, this is also the elastomeric bearing, which is reinforced with steel plates. Uh, this is, of course, a seismic isolation uh, system that decouples the pier from the deck. And this is what we see within our software, pre-processing software, and of course, post-processing software. Uh, you should have talked about, uh, and we spoke about in the SCA 420, computer applications and civil engineering, but especially in the finite element course, you should have spoken about the solution uh, of a problem which foresees three different software, the pre-processing software, the solver, and the post-processing software. So the pre-processing software and the post-processing software are the softwares that allow us to develop the model and then view the results respectively, right? So the first one is for developing the model. The solver is the one that takes the model and converts it into a numerical problem, which is solved, linear, non-linear, static, dynamic, and so on and so on. And then after we get the results, the post-processing software is the one that allows us to visualize our results, which is extremely important. Imagine reading numbers, right? It's also looking at the formation, shapes, and so on and so on. So um, this is the reinforcement detailing and the technical drawing of the, the trapezoidal deck of this reinforced concrete bridge in Dubai. And as you can see, this is the uh, detailed model uh, that was developed for the needs of uh, uh, the modeling, in this case of the structure, which had uh, more than half a million embedded rebars in order to model the exact reinforcement uh, found within the concrete domain. And as I said before, Conan Fea is the software that is used here in order to perform the analysis. And FIMAP is what we use as pre-processing and post-processing uh, software. So FIMAP has the ability to export neutral files, that text files which are read by our solver. And then the, the model is developed, the numerical problem is formed, solved, and then exporting, writing out the output. So this is how this works. And, um, uh, you can also ask uh, Michael Yu, who is now uh, just finished his research for the needs of his honors uh, work, right? That 10, 12 page paper. And he will be able also to provide to you with uh, more information, given the fact that he did use Recon and FEA and FIMAP for the needs of his research. And I will show you some of his results if I recall. Well, I added some of his results as well, if I'm not mistaken, maybe not. Anyway, so um, when we model materials in a separate way, in an independent way, we need a material model for concrete, which should be a 3D one. And of course, one for steel. For the concrete material, we're using the modified code Soros and Pavlovich, uh, as it was a pro in this case, uh, suggested by Baba Dragagis and Marco, myself that is. So one part of my PhD was to improve numerically the material modeling of concrete, which we successfully did. Then Murlas Christos came, Dr. Murlas, he was a PhD student of mine, now he's a postdoc. He, he also contributed significantly to the cyclic material model, the material model that can perform cyclic analysis, which we will see many results here today. So here we have the Kotsovos and Pavlovich model, which foresees a back modulus and a shear modulus and the connection between the normal and the shear stresses and strains. And of course, in this case, the uh, this model derived from regression by using experimental data and uh, the definition of the uniaxial compressive strength, the tensile strength, the Poisson ratio, and the remaining shear strength are the only parameters that the user has to define, and then everything is done automatically. This is a great and big advantage because many material models <coughs> out there require like 15 
different uh, properties and more some of them they don't even have a physical meaning they are just there uh, to complement the numerical model which may, makes things extremely difficult when we investigate uh, parametrically investigate uh, any type of problem so this is what i said before murlas christos uh, contributed through this uh, publication for the uh, ability to model under cyclic conditions our reinforced concrete structures and of course one might wonder what's the difference between monotonic and cyclic monotonic is the one where we push only we apply lot, only along one direction a cyclic is when i take let's say column i push it towards the left then i bring it back i push it towards the right and so on this is a cyclic analysis and of course we know when we have a cyclic analysis we have opening and closing of cracks. Now one, might, one also might wonder, when do we open a crack? So this is the failure criterion with this long formula. And when this is satisfied, so our stress is larger than this ultimate stress, then we have the opening of crack. crack and of course, we can have two openings of cracks uh, at a specific Gauss point. Uh, you've learned what Gauss points are, right? I uh, have no doubt about it. Yes? No? What is a Gauss point in a finite element? Did you speak about Gauss points or not yet? So if I have a hexahedral element, eight noted hexahedral element, I can have a two by two by two or a three by three by three second order and third order Gauss points, which are control points within the finite element. For each and every Gauss point, I calculate the material matrix, the constitutive material matrix, which is a six by six matrix. And then through relevant integration, I'm able to form the stiffness matrix of this uh, finite element. And of course, I can use that to calculate the stresses given that I calculated the strain. So these control points, uh, eight noted usually use eight control points, eight Gauss points. Uh, each and every Gauss point um, can be numerically controlled through modifying accordingly the material uh, matrix. As you can see here, uh, when a first crack appears, then we set this value to zero and the largest tensile principal stress is set to zero. And therefore, this is how we take it to consideration numerically the opening of cracks and this is this has a very uh, high advantage that we avoid changing the mesh we haven't discontinued it due to a crack but we do not introduce it physically in the mesh so we keep the initial mesh and this is the reason why this method methodology is known as the smeared crack approach this is the convex convex strength envelope as you can see uh, principal stress one, two, and three. And if we have any situation which is located outside this convex strength envelope, it means that uh, that Gauss point has cracked as well. Now, I said before, one Gauss point can develop two cracks. If we have a third crack, this is when we lose that Gauss point completely. And we assume that the strength there is practically equal to zero. But this is a simplistic approach. Uh, when we updated this formulation, we took also into consideration a remaining strength there due to inter, uh, interlocking of the gravel and friction uh, that is present in this case uh, at that location. So I'm done with the theory. I will not uh, <laughs> confuse you anymore with that. Of course, if somebody is interested to read more, just send me an email. For those that uh, do not know my email, I will type it here. It's george.marco at up.ac.za. Right? Just send me an email. Oh, I made a mistake. Let me type it again. Okay, George Osmar. Uh, all right. So, uh, in this case, um, I can send you our publications, uh, work from students, and you can have a read uh, if you are interested, that is, to learn more. 
Now, when it comes to testing the developed algorithm, if you have an algorithm that you've developed and you want to test it, the best way to go is to get from the international literature um, results from actual experiments, right? So say, how do I know that my finite element analysis software can reproduce or even predict the mechanical response of reinforced concrete structures? So experiments is the only way to go. And of course, in this case, uh, one might say, why not perform your own and execute your own experiments? Well, you say, all right, if I perform my own experiments and then I perform my own analysis, which is done, um, this will not have uh, as much merit as if I take the experimental results from somebody else and then I'll say, I did not control the experiments. I, don't mod I did not modify the results accordingly in order to show that um, I have the ability to do so. So the, in this case, the beam column joint tested by Garcia et al. Garcia was a senior researcher at the University of Sheffield. We met there in 2018. And when he was a PhD student, if I'm not, uh, before we met him, uh, he, he was doing his research on retrofitting of reinforced concrete uh, structures. Have you ever spoken about the retrofitting and strengthening of structures? so far uh, in your career as students and civil engineering students? Have you ever heard about strengthening of structures? And how is it performed? Why do we need strengthening? How do we strengthen? How do we calculate the new strength of the structure after we apply the retrofitic the profiting technique. Anyone? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat area nor any hands raised. Rehard? As class rep? Retrofitting or strengthening? I've, I've heard of retrofitting and strengthening, but I haven't dealt with it ever. Okay. So, um, only a little bit. Okay. Um, believe it or not, the most comprehensive, uh, of course you believe it, the most comprehensive uh, design code on retrofitting is Greek Kanepe, which is the corresponding uh, retrofitting design code and it's more than 300 pages long. Of course, most of the uh, suggestions and recommendations there are relied on semi-empirical methodologies. And this is something that we can actually improve significantly when we use this type of uh, tools and we develop this type of tools, which now we know that they actually can reproduce and predict the mechanical response of the trapezoid structure. So, as you can see here, uh, Garcia Reyes is his first name. I'm not Mr. Garcia, no, Reyes is his surname. So uh, he developed different joints with different reinforcement and different anchorage configuration. And they designed these to develop slippage. So this is the column and this is the beam. And that's why we have the actual force here in order to model the corresponding superstructural loads and a cyclic load was applied at the tip of the beam. So this is the experimental configuration. And of course, as you can see, this is a bare reinforced concrete joint with the cracks after the end of the experiment. And this was the model that was developed in the current fair with the help of FIMAP in order to model the mechanical response of the structure. And of course, we also used the new concrete and steel damage factors uh, in order to capture the deterioration due to the cyclic loading of this joint. This was uh, published in Marco et al. 2021. So this is the uh, JB2 specimen, which is a bare reinforced concrete specimen. And then what was done, which was also super interesting, was that they removed all the pieces, the cracked concrete, they cleared the 
pulling out they stretch they applied high strength concrete and then they wrapped it with CFRP sheets, meaning carbon fiber reinforced polymer cloth, let's say. So you're wrapping it, right? And of course, with specific special epoxy materials, you bond it with concrete, and this is how you rehabilitate and you strengthen the damaged structure. So of course, this was performed for the case of this joint. Very interesting. So these are some data about the finite element mesh uh, that was used in order to discretize the two models. And these were the material properties as well. Con the normal concrete was 20 mega, uh, excuse me, 20 gigapascal, 31.3 megapascal in action from residual strength. The young module was 20 gigapascal. And the high strength concrete was 55.3 megapascal. And as you can see, steel rebars, a high strength, yielding strength, 16 and 80 milli. And of course, CFRP was 4.14 gigapascal tensile strength. Now, this is the comparison for the PR reinforced concrete specimen between numerical and experimental results. As you can see, there are differences, but definitely, if you take into consideration how accurate the experiment is and what can go wrong definitely the comparison here uh, it's uh, showing really good results and especially the retrofitted one as you can see this is the uh, experiment that was performed on the strength and joint while it was tested again and as you can see the initial bear strength was around uh, 60 kilonewton and the strength and one was more than 120 kilonewton. So the new joint, which was already uh, broken through the test, the bare one, and then strengthened through the use of CFRP and high strength concrete, derived a higher capacity, higher strength than the initial one. And of course, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Guadagnini, Professor Pilagudas at the University of Sheffield, and Professor Papadragagis at the National Technical University of Athens. Garcia Reyes was the senior um, researcher back then at the, the University of Sheffield. Now he's at Harwick, an assistant professor, and Murlas, my former PhD student, who is now a postdoc. Uh, he was in Lyon in France, a postdoc, and now he, uh, he started the second postdoc as well. Very interesting stuff. Now one might say, all right, what about those new damage factors that you propose? What do they actually do? And this is what they do. If we do not activate them during the cyclic analysis, these are the hysteretic. Let me write this. Hystere, hysteretic cycles that will get, as you can see, uh, slippage and deterioration of concrete strength are not accounted for, and therefore the energy that is absorbed is significantly larger than in reality. So this is how significant these damage factors are and allow us to capture the pinching, right? Not punching, pinching phenomenon. Pinching phenomenon is this necking that you notice during uh, the cyclic analysis, and this is uh, uh, shown and found in the bed of that curve, total applied load versus displacement. So this is due to slippage phenomena and other phenomena that actually do not allow when we, act when, when we reverse the loading, uh, they do not allow our reinforced concrete structural member to fully resist and absorb energy like in this case here. All right, does that make sense? It's like I push towards the right and the crack opens. That crack has zero strength, right? It doesn't resist. Now, if I bring the column back and push towards the other direction, that, that crack will close and then it will resist to compression again. So this means and where, whilst it was open, it contributed nothing. And until it closed again and developed compression, it was contributing zero uh, resistance to our structure. 
And of course, imagine if you have a rebar which is uh, sliding under, when it's under tension, it will not resist, but, but when it's under compression, again, it will add resistance back and it will contribute to the resistance of the structural member. So these are all extremely interesting concepts. And of course, this is the most important type of loading, given the fact that in reality, any dynamic load will cause our structure to um, develop cyclic loading, earthquakes, wind loads, blast loading, right? There is a special now area where you can learn how to design structures under blast loading, believe it or not. I teach that course um, uh, at the university, design of structures under blast loading one and two at the master level. Very interesting stuff. You, you, you find out again many resemblances between blast loading design and reinforced concrete design. But uh, unfortunately, so far in, at our university, uh, we haven't introduced earthquake resistant design that much. But hopefully, this will change given the fact that I suggested adding this course um, as a part of our curriculum. Um, the, let us hope that we will be able, at least as a short course, we will be able to initiate it and maybe you can join that course as professional civil engineers and not just as uh, honor students. Now, this is the animation of the solid bone misses strains uh, as it resulted from the numerical analysis. And as you can see, uh, I deactivated the hexahedral elements of the beam which is the perpendicular structural member in this case. And of course, uh, you can see the damage development within the joint as it was uh, predicted from the nonlinear numerical cyclic analysis. And of course, the embedded rebars and their deformation, these are the four phi 16 at the top and bottom, and the phi 8 stirrups that they were used for shear strengthening of this specimen. And of course, these are the results as they, as they derive from Rincon and Fair. Now, one might say, very nice. We love this approach, but what are the methods out there that we use in order to strengthen our structures other than the carbon fiber reinforced polymer, right? Jacketing. And uh, the answer is we have different approaches. One more is reinforced concrete jacketing. We have the initial column. We apply reinforcement around this initial column, the existing column, and then we concrete it and we create a jacket that's made out of reinforced concrete. This increases the section of the column, strengthens the, uh, it strengthens in this case the framing system and uh, we strengthen the structure overall, but there is a catch there. In any strengthening approach, we need to make sure that our strengthening will not uh, cause more problems than it will solve. And I will explain to you in a bit what that means. Now, the best way to go based on our research so far is the infill reinforced concrete shear walls. And we say we have an opening, I will remove this wall and uh, I will construct a reinforced concrete shear wall and I will connect it with the existing columns, foundation and uh, beam. Of course, we need to take care of the foundation, make sure that it's sufficient. And this will increase significantly the strength and the resistance of our framing system. And then the question rises: which is the best way to go? And we say, hmm, what do you think? usually the clients are looking for when they are trying to strengthen if they found out that their house let's say in the framing system of their house requires strengthening what is the number one concern that they have any ideas yes. cost cost yes who is this uh, sorry my name is johan um, yes, I would say on. cost, perhaps. <laughs> this is the, the, the first thing and the last thing that they care about. 
maybe they will care also something else related to cost. When is it going to be finished? <laughs> right? So this is what us, even the best civil engineer in the world that cares about safety, uh, if you are the client and if I am the client, the first thing that I will ask is how much, right? What's the benefit of this? option uh, in relation to that option. And again, the value, the, the issue of money always rises. And usually the ones that get the job and they are assigned a specific job and a project are the ones that they are the most cost effective. At the same time, you have to be safe, of course, and satisfy the design codes, but cost in this case is very important. So this uh, publication in 2021 publication uh, was developed by myself and uh, I proposed that a new method of, of seismic retrofitting cost analysis and effectiveness for reinforced concrete structures. And in this case, uh, we, I used the more advanced constitutive material models, which you can see here. This is the damage factor as it was proposed by Dr. Murlaz, uh, myself and Professor Kwabadragagis. And uh, of course, this is the fully crushed Gauss point where you have the remaining resistance. As you can see, the diagonals are not equal to zero. And of course, in this case, we also propose the damage factors for steel rivers, which can, which can be seen here. And these are directly connected to the number of opening and closing of cracks within the concrete domain. The more opening and closing of cracks we count during the nonlinear cyclic analysis, the more we assume in this case that the deterioration of concrete uh, will develop. Right? So it will become even less strong. It will become weaker. It will deteriorate. And of course, deteriorate concrete. If you have rivers in there, the transfer of internal forces from the rivers to the concrete domain will decrease as well. And this is where this lovely damage factor for steel rivers comes in place. So this is a Mahini and Arona specimen. And I said, all right, I will publish that uh, with uh, Professor Pilagudas and Pro uh, Garcia uh, Reyes. Uh, but we were, I was a visiting professor there. It was a single team, our experiments, sort of, right? and our analysis so let's try another one let's find something in the international literature and model that as well and see if we can get in this case good results and also let's see if the hybrid approach is working this is another contribution of my phd thesis where i said all right in this joint we will have significant three-dimensional stress and stress situations a significant shear deformation that will require the detailed approach in order to capture that complicated behavior. But what about this part here of the beam? Can I model it with a, sim a more simplistic finite element? And therefore I connected this 3D detail approach with the 1D natural beam column flexibility-based finite element, which is rather complicated by itself, but we know that beam column finite elements, they assume flat sections, undeformed sections, bending, shear, axial, and in this case, three bending, uh, two bending, one torsion, uh, two shear and one axial. 12 by 12 is the stiffness matrix of this finite element and connect them in order to increase the computational time. So decrease the computational cost, but maintain the accuracy. And of course, this is the, these are the results. As you can see, these are two curves, experimental and numerical. And these are two more curves, experimental and numerical. And as you can see, it's almost a perfect uh, comparison in this case uh, for the two specimens that they tested. As you can see, the approach here was to glue 
CFRP uh, material, which is a few millimeters uh, in this case uh, of thickness, and increase the strength of the joint, not wrap it entirely and confine it, which is the best way to go, but just apply it like that. And one might say, why? Maybe I do not have access, or maybe I will need to break even the slab in order to apply the approach where I have a full confinement. So more cost. So this is faster, easier, and less costly. And of course, one of my favorites, the Toronto Deep Beam. Now, if I'm about to draw a human being here, This is a human being with a height of one meter and 80 centimeters. This is how they will look like. The height of this reinforced concrete panel is four meters and the span is 19 meters. This side here was reinforced with shear reinforcement and this side here was left unreinforced. The load was applied exactly at this point, and this was a prediction competition, and they asked the scientists to provide with their predictions. And they told them it's a monotonic loading problem, but in reality, it was not. Why? Because they applied the load, then they stopped. They recorded the cracks by marking them. Then they reapplied load, more load, then they stopped. They removed the load. So it was like apply load, remove, apply load, remove. So what do you think? Is this a monotonic loading or is this a cyclic loading? It's a cyclic loading, right? Load and load. All right, I'm not pushing it to go to the other side, but again, loading and unloading is a cyclic load. So I need to have the ability to come back from the deformed shape that was caused by a specific level of load and then remove it and come back uh, to an equilibrium, reach an equilibrium again. So what you are going to see with white lines are the cracks as they were predicted by Conan Fair. So let's play this animation. So the first cracks are perpendicular under the load, under the imposed load. Now you see the unloading, you see the thinning and the disappearing of some cracks. Now we have load again. As you can see, the thickening of white cracks means the cracks become thicker, right? So we, saw some we see some diagonal cracks developing on the left panel. Now we unload again and on the right as well. Now we start loading again. And of course, we don't care about the left side because it does have reinforced concrete shear stirrups. And therefore, the failure occurs due to a large diagonal crack opening on the right, on the right span. And this is the actual experiment. You can see humans there uh, that are measuring the cracks, uh, uh, marking the cracks, and the comparison between the numerical and the experimental results. So this is another uh, model. Uh, this is the, the actual reinforced concrete uh, bridge that uh, we've seen in that first slide. And these are the geometrical details and the reinforcement details as they were provided from the consulting office. And as you can see, the span is 100 meters. The side view is an arc shape. This is curvy, and we modeled this 100% uh, with 100% accuracy as it is shown there. And of course, we included the elastomeric bearings as well. These are some uh, uh, numbers in relation to the mesh. Uh, 47,839 macro elements were created, but one macro element could 
penetrate up to 50 hexahedral elements. So after you uh, perform the mesh generation procedure, you, uh, we ended up with more than half a million embedded rebars. Each and every hexahedral element consists of the embedded rebar, which is handled according to the deformation of the hexahedral elements. And of course, the hexahedral elements were more than 100,000. You see the embedded rebars, different co <coughs> colors uh, represent different diameters, and of course, the reinforcement as it can be seen uh, within uh, the numerical model. Now, this is just the snapshot of the rebar elements as they were found in um, FIMAP, and of course, the deformed shape with a scale factor, of course, and an amplification scale in order to see the deformations even better. And of course, you can see how the uh, cage here and the reinforcement of this reinforced concrete bridge deforms. And this is a close-up deformed shape of the concrete and the rebars. This is the diaphragm. This is one meter thick, by the way, diaphragm, which is found in the middle. And also this reinforced concrete bridge was it was post-tensioned. It has a post-tensioning system that was also modeled in this case. Now, after I performed a pushover analysis, a monotonic analysis, I said to myself, hasn't done, I haven't done it before, and it hasn't been done before anywhere in the international literature. Why not perform a cyclic analysis on this very large numerical model? So this was the normalized applied displacement and the implosive cycle. And this is, of course, the total base shear versus horizontal displacement as it resulted from the analysis. And these are the, this is the animation of the crack openings. Now, remember, first, if I'm mistaken, we push towards this direction from left to right. Then we bring it back. Then we push again from right to left. Then we bring it back again. And as you can see, this what we are going to see here is a massive opening and closing of cracks. And of course, this shows the ability of Recon and Fair to manage this challenging, non-linear, extremely non-linear numerical problems. So let's play this. Now, initially, we push from right to left, and then you see the cracks appear here initially, and now they are closing, and then we have the opening of cracks. You have the cracks at the piers that they open and close as well. And as you can see, then decoupling also how the isolating system works. The deck is moving and deforming, but the piers do not follow that deformation because we have our suspension there. They are isolated. The elastomeric uh, bearing, right, which can deform uh, way more than concrete, and therefore this is like the suspension of our structure. All right. Let us have, I think, now a 10 minutes break, and then we will continue to with this presentation, which will refer. Let me see what's going on here. All right, I will check it out and see what's behind because I think these two slides should not be there. But uh, we are going to talk about another experiment that was performed in Italy. This is an actual specimen, reinforced concrete specimen, four-story reinforced concrete structure, which was 12 meters tall. And uh, this dimension here was about nine meters and this the opening here was about six meters and it was tested under cyclic loading conditions and we took this experiment and modeled it with recon and fair and got results uh, and therefore we're going to see these results and the ability of the software also to reproduce these results okay all right So if you don't have any questions, let's have a 10 minute break. 
this is what we should have had. All right, now it's okay. So if you don't have any questions, so 10 minutes break and we'll be back to continue with this presentation. I need to accelerate a bit because yeah, we will we'll run out of time and I will not be able to show you everything. So see you in 10, thank you.
All right, just type something in the chat area so I'll know that you can hear me. Let us continue with this presentation. Hi, Bruno. Okay, Mati Medja and Johan are here. What about the rest? Can you hear me? All right. Obeyemi, Tambiseng. Okay, great. And Dila. So, we said and we spoke about uh, retrofitting techniques and how we model that. And of course, we have here, in addition to the steel reinforcement, we can use glass fiber, aramide fiber, and carbon fiber reinforced polymer rebars, in addition to um, the other strength strengthening technique, which was CFRP sheet, right? So if we are about to create a reinforced concrete, we can shear wall, we can reinforce it with these four different types of materials that are shown here. And of course, this is the displacement history that was applied at the top floor of this model. And these are the results, as you can see, the hysteretic behavior of the models with and without material damage factors. As you can see here, the pinching effect is larger the, the, of the red line uh, compared to the black one. And of course, this is important given the fact that we perform a cyclic analysis. This is the model and this is how the actual specimen looked like, except from the slabs. The slabs were normal slabs, but here, given that we are using a hybrid approach, I created an X-type uh, rigid uh, diaphragm for each and every slab uh, to take that into consideration. These are the rebars within the shear wall. So this was the initial uh, framing system. And then these reinforced concrete infill shear walls were constructed. And as you can see, at the base, at the edges, uh, CFRP sheet was applied in order to avoid local failure. And uh, in total, 24 different cases were uh, modeled in order to investigate the effectiveness of uh, each and every retrofitting approach. And as you can see, this is the maximum base shear that uh, each and every model developed for the case of retrofitting CFRP uh, columns and beams with CFRP sheet and the high static energy that was uh, computed based on the cyclic nonlinear analysis. And when you see here five at the end, it means five millimeters thick layer. And when you see two, three, four, five, means that two, only the ground floor, ground floor and first floor, uh, ground for first floor and th second floor, and then the entire frame was retrofitted with Sivar Kushi. So we had also combinations of retrofitting. And as you can see, the ones that the entire, uh, all the, the entire building was retrofitted derived the highest values, which was expected. We used more material and therefore we expect, uh, in this case, higher uh, strength, but more material means more cost. So this is also here uh, results uh, that relate to von Mises strains as they resulted for uh, a horizontal deformation of 23 milli, negative 23 milli, and 50 milli. So as you can see, the strains that develop within the joint, which usually we do not take into consideration and we do not model when we use beam column finite elements, uh, is evident. So this means that if, if I strengthen this area here, more strains will develop within the joint and the joint might, might reach sooner towards failure. So our interventions play an important role on how the rest of the framing system will behave. So this was a finding that was confirmed through this research work, which was very, very interesting. And of course, uh, in this case, the corresponding maximum base shear and has theoretic energy for different models in the case of the infill reinforced concrete shear wall. And of course, the values here are double than what we had with the CFRP. 
And uh, as you can see, the best in terms of high static energy is the case where we use glass fiber reinforcement instead of steel reinforcement. But in terms of strength, the best will derive in the case where we use carbon fiber polymer, reinforced polymer rebars, which of course they are the strongest and in this case hardest out of the materials that we investigated here. Now, when it comes to um, cost, this is the cost in euros to increase the base shear by 1%. So we said, okay, what's the total increase in base shear? And what did we pay? So what does actually cost to increase the strength by 1%? So as you can see in this case, the best is BC2F, which is a re reinforced concrete shear wall infill applied only at the ground floor and first floor, right? And this is the cost in euros to increase the dissipated energy by 1%. As you can see, this model derived a negative value, which means that we're actually losing money here. Why? Because the, un uh, the, the initial frame, which was not retrofitted whatsoever, derived at the last final cycles a higher hysteretic energy than the retrofitted one. And as you can see, this is the case where only ground floor first, uh, first floor um, are retrofitted and only the columns there are retrofitted, which means that instead of doing, uh, instead of helping our framing system, we're actually uh, doing the exact opposite. Okay. Does that make sense? And of course, this is attributed to the redistribution of the internal forces and sending damages to other parts of the structure. And after a while, after a few cycles, then the retrofit structure doesn't perform as well compared to the initial framing system. So this was a very interesting finding. So this is the optimum retrofitting cost factor that I've developed through this. Um, um, uh, research work, and uh, I also uh, recommended some uh, uh, cost and parameters, which represents the important factor of strength and energy dissipation. What we are interested more in increasing the energy dissipation or the strength of the structure, and then eventually you end up getting a value which will tell you uh, which is the optimum approach to proceed with. So as you can see here, the model which assumes and foresees uh, the use of aramide. Okay, that was not intentional. The one that foresaw uh, aramide reinforced uh, polymer um, uh, rebars was the one who derived the optimum solution in terms of energy and strength, okay? All right, if we are back. Now, and of course, what we should say here is that the higher the value of ORCF, the more optimum the solution. Now, another subject, very interesting subject, is the soil structure interactions. So as you can see, we can discretize the soil with hexahedral elements and the superstructure. And of course, the superstructure is modeled by using a 3D detail approach, concrete and rebars, and the soil. One model is the Rambert Osgood model uh, that we can use, and uh, the steel material for the reinforcement with the damage factors. And therefore, we can have full nonlinearities in both concrete and superstructure uh, during a cyclic analysis. Now, this is uh, the geometry of a two story reinforced concrete specimen that was tested by Garidis back in the days. Um, I just finished high school in 1997. And we modeled this under dynamic loading conditions because was, this was a seismic table experiment. And the idea was to capture and reproduce the results. And after we did that successfully, we said, all right, now that we have a specimen that actually in a model that can actually capture exactly the experimental results with, the, with very good accuracy, 
let's remove the fixed support and change it, replace it with soil and perform the same dynamic analysis, nonlinear analysis, and then capture the exact and quantify the soil structure interaction effect and the, the effect that it has on the superstructural overall mechanical response. So as you can see here, these are, this is the percentage of, in terms of increase of the, uh, of the roof deformation, maximum roof deformation uh, for different models, uh, model A and B uh, referred to six meters and 11 meters depth of soil, rock, medium soil and soft soil. And of course, uh, as you can see, uh, the largest deformation occurred in the case of the soft soil, as it was expected, and here we see the maximum dissipated energy due to the soil. The dissipated energy is way larger, given the fact that the soil behaves as a big damper under our structure. Now, the single one span two story reinforced concrete specimen was double, and we created a more realistic structure. And, the mo and we modeled this uh, in order to. Uh, investigate the mechanical response and the dynamic response of this framing system. As you can see here, this is the horizontal displacement versus time. And therefore, the dashed line, which is the soft soil, derived the largest deformation for this first dynamic wave. And this is very interesting as well. At the beginning of this analysis, we also have seen the total base shear. And the black lines represents the vertical base shear. So when we run the analysis, the self weight is applied and we have a vertical base shear. And given the fact that we have a soil, the structure compresses the soil and it starts oscillating vertically in addition to the horizontal deformation. But here we show that the effects are not significant and this stabilizes and then the vertical oscillation actually dissipates through time. Now, this is uh, the case where we applied two different accelerograms, and this is the response of the models for the first one, and this is the second. And as you can see, the medium soil case derives larger deformations, and this is due to resonance phenomena. Did you speak about resonance? in any of your courses. All right, Johan says yes. So with uh, Prof. Chris Roth. All right, so this is what happened here, but instead of resonating with the soft soil where we expect to have a larger deformation, the medium soil uh, also has its own frequency and therefore here we have uh, a resonance due to the frequency of the accelerogram, the frequency of the soil and the frequency of the structure which is damaged. So if a structure is getting damaged then the fundamental periods change as well and the fundamental frequencies and this is shown in these um, eigenfrequency versus time. So what we do here for each and every of these three models, we calculate the fundamental period of the structure according to its current stiffness matrix, including the damages, right? So these are a little bit more advanced concepts. And of course, this shows and revealed that the case of the medium soil the frequencies and the fundamental period of the framing system uh, was closer to the frequency of the medium soil. And this is the reason why we had that phenomenon where the damages and deformation was, were larger for the case of the model that assumed a medium soil, right? So soft soil like 65 megapascal uh, young modulus a medium soil uh, was around uh, 300, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, hard soil, uh, rock soil is like concrete. So in this case, it's the fixed model. All right. So this is just a small example on how complex 
is uh, the actual investigation of the dynamic nonlinear response of a framing system that is founded on soil. You have nonlinearities coming from everywhere. So if you have a tool like, like that that takes into consideration all these phenomena, then definitely uh, it's a big advantage. Now, let us stop and change a bit the tune here and let's say a few things about machine learning. Have you ever spoken about machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms with any of your professors so far? No, Johan says. Uh, have you ever heard about artificial intelligence? Okay, Johan says yes. What about the rest? So if I ask you what is uh, artificial intelligence algorithm or the machine learning algorithm? So everybody's heard. So it's like an algorithm which takes an input, right? And connects the dots with the output and provides us with the model that if I give new input data, which were not included in the data set, the training data set, the data set that I used to train, then it will give me a prediction that will be realistic and this is something really hard to do manually. Now, in this case, we have different machine learning algorithms. We have linear regression, higher order regression, random forest, gradient boosting, X boosting, artificial neural networks, deep learning, and so on and so on. But each and every method has their own advantages and we don't have a feed all method. Like, give me any data set, I will use this method and I will give you a model that will be very accurate and it will fit the results and it will have also extendability. Extendability is the ability of a model to predict the results out of sample, which are not included in the training or testing data sets. So what we did here, we created, let's say, uh, a set of models, uh, thousands of models. We performed tests through Recon and FEA. We developed a very large data set and then we use that data set in order to um, develop a model. Everything was done on a computer, right? This is Zelda's work, by the way, it's, it's bigger man. And uh, this is the formula that was developed. And then we took 36 reinforced concrete beams, which were experimentally tested and tested this formula. It was able to capture the strength of these beams, which were tested under three point bending tests. So as you can see, this is the comparison between the prediction and the experimental uh, failure values. The closer the values are in this diagonal, towards this diagonal, line the better the results are and uh, of course this gave us a 47 percent mean average error compared to euro code and the american code which gave us more than 100 percent 112 for euro code and 145 percent for aci uh, latest version 2019. so now you understand the power of these methodologies uh, which uh, this was a work done by a Scripps student. And of course the formula I developed in Europe code and the American code took decades and decades until they were developed and still they, are, they suffer uh, from issues related to accuracy. Now, when it comes to performing training of artificial intelligence algorithms, computational demand is very high. So in this case, we developed with Prof Professor Bagas Dr. Nicolaus Bagas, which is a good friend of mine, uh, we developed an algorithm that is able to use the parallel stochastic gradient descent and perform the training by using GPUs on a supercomputer. 64 GPUs and each one costed, cost 10,000 US dollars. They were Tesla graphics cards. So 35,849 data sets were used. These are some statistic metrics of independent variables like the span of the structure, the effective width, the effective depth, the width, the uniaxial compressive strength of concrete, the young modulus of concrete, tensile strength of concrete, this percentage. And uh, then we have, in this case, Vita, 
which is the remaining shear strength, uh, steel young modulus elasticity, yielding strength of steel, and reinforcement ratio. After training, uh, by the way, this is an example uh, on the speed up of the proposed algorithm, which is absolutely amazing. It's almost linear, which doesn't happen a lot in when we are running, uh, in this case, parallel uh, problems. And of course, uh, when we were running 64 GPUs at the same time, it means we were using 640,000 euros or US dollars, same now, for, unfortunately for us, that we use euros, uh, uh, in order to perform the training of this problem. And these are dropout effects and loss functions during training in parallel and uh, results for low drop of 0 0.1, 0 0.01. So this shows how fast the training and the validation is performed and the faster, the better and more accuracy, of course, <clears throat> and the lower the loss. And uh, overall, our newly developed distributed training algorithm was able to provide with a more accurate predictive model, 50% lower error for this problem compared to the initial proposed model. So we destroyed our own selves and destroyed, I mean, uh, the performance, we improved it by 50%. And this shows also the importance and significance of this model. Now, we also had a very large, and we still do, a very large research project uh, in developing predictive models that will provide us with the fundamental period of reinforced concrete and steel structures. And we're using Cyclone to do that as well, to perform thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of analysis to get data sets and then use them to model. Is this what you are looking here are different models that for CCR rules or not. And uh, they are founded on uh, soil and uh, taking into consideration the soil structure interaction phenomena as well. Meaning like we have a formula that we can uh, use in order to calculate the expected fundamental period of this type of structures by taking into consideration also the soil effects, which makes things more flexible. More flexibility means higher period, right? There is no uh, fundamental period formula that takes into consideration soil structure interaction and uh, so far in the design, international design codes, and we managed to do that by using this approach. This is the case of steel structures, Ashley's work. Uh, she is doing an amazing work. And this is the algorithm, the higher regression algorithm that we're using her to develop the predictive formula. And these are typical steel structures uh, which are founded on soil or they are fixed. And these are the maximum and minimum parameters uh, for the model developed in terms of geometry and material properties. So the soil depth is between 1 and 37.5 meters, deep soil. Soil is between 65 megapascal and 700 megapascal, young modulus of elasticity. The height of the building is 3.5 up to 35 meters tall. And the length now, we these are the old ones. Now we went to 10 spans and 12 spans, uh, which means more than 70, 80 meters in width and length. Of course, this is the period, fundamental period of a, a model ships of first model ship and second model ship of a four story, one bay steel building. Uh, we developed 1,152 data points. These were the parameters used to train and develop a predictive formula. And this is the actual relationship between the numerical predicted and formula predicted fundamental periods on test and training data set practically is 100%, 99.95 correlation factor. And of course, the uh, proposed formula was tested and validated on uh, 168 new numerical predicted fundamental periods that derived from models that we did not use to get their results and use those results to train our formula. So they are out of sample data. And of course, as you can see, uh, the out of sample uh, predictive capabilities of the developed formula are excellent. 99.7% was the correlation factor. And if you compare 
our error, our mean absolute error, which was 2.8%, which is practically zero. Uh, 76 for the Euro code uh, 8, which is also the South African code formula, given that the South African code uh, adopted EC8 with some uh, modifications, but the fundamental period is the exact same one. And of course, this is the CINITA 2012 uh, equation that was proposed at driver 92% error. So as you can see again, this is a very powerful tool and provides the ability now to, pro to give uh, to civil engineers and you utilize them and fortify them with tools that will allow them um, to calculate the fundamental period of structures more accurately when they design their structures and when we design our structures. <laughs> now, uh, this is the 40 feature formula. One might say, oh my God, what is this? Uh, this is madness, right? <laughs> Am I going to apply this manually? So, definitely, uh, this is not for manual calculations. You just program it in an Excel sheet or uh, in this case, uh, develop an application, which we already did for the reinforced concrete uh, structures case. And uh, definitely we can calculate easily in milliseconds the fundamental period of our structures. Any questions before we move to bioengineering? I know it's a lot of information very and a lot of new concepts, but as you can see, the finite element method doesn't stop only in linear analysis or non-linear analysis, can be extended. And as we're going to see here, my PhD student, Martin Boster, which is a dentist, and also with the contribution of Mr. DeWalt, Gravet, DeWalt, was one of the best students ever passed from the campus of our university and our civil engineering department in 2019. Uh, he's a civil engineer now, consultant and a magician when it comes to modeling. He's very, very capable. And he also assisted with this work, which foresaw the investigation of eight human teeth. Four of them were healthy, another four were prepped, meaning like a hole was open in the middle and it was filled with resin. And then we tested them by applying the loads shown here on this, uh, on this slide. Now, CT scans were performed and imagine one CT scan image, 3D image was 800 megabyte in size it was huge. So it took that file, converted it eventually into uh, surfaces and volumes within FIMAP, and then discretization was performed by using tetrahedral elements. Did you speak about tetrahedral elements? All right, so you know what tetrahedral elements are. This is the model of a tooth which consists of different material, right? The animal, the dentin, gutta percha, don't ask me what that is, the bone, the roots, and so on and so on, right? And as you can see here, this is a de stress distribution. This is kilonewton per millimeter square. As you can see with the red uh, color, are the areas where cracks occur and the failure occur due to those cracks. And this is the, if I remove the animal, this is the inside distribution of the stresses. As they resulted from the nonlinear analysis, we used NX Nastran to perform this analysis. And this is the internal part of the tooth, which did not develop significant stresses, uh, which shows that practically uh, the crack here that developed was the cause of failure, given the fact that when we chew, the forces that are developed are applied on the surface of the tooth. And this is the full model with the bone, which of course, as you can see, this is 
é, bone tooth interaction analysis. And if we see the structural engineers, what will we see? Soil superstructure, foundation superstructure, externally applied loads, material properties, stresses, strains, ultimate strength, which we know for the different parts of the tooth and the bone. The bone was the most difficult one to find, believe it or not. And then we say, ah, oh, we need to apply 30 kilograms in order to break this tooth. We need to apply 25 kilograms or 20. And if we have a hole here and the resin, which has specific material properties, which are also known, this is modeled as well. And we say, this is the decrease in terms of strength. So I wouldn't say everything is civil engineering, but definitely mechanics of materials, structural response of 3D structures, which is, has a bit of weird shape, I will admit that, but at the end of the day, the concepts and the fundamentals are the same. Do you agree? Maybe not, I don't know. Can you see a structure and the foundation and the soil? This is what I see when I see that, by the way. Uh, Johan says, how would one determine the material properties of a tooth? How will you determine the material properties of concrete? Johan. A compressive test in a lab. Exactly. Take a tooth, break it, you get your values. Young modulus of elasticity, uh, ultimate uniaxial compressive strength, tensile strength, and so on. It's the same thing, right? Yeah, but it's just, it just more, it's just smaller. I, I agree with you. Different yeah. geometry, different sizes, but again, it's the same concept. Nothing changes. Of course, ask a dentist about it, they will know nothing. Like when I want, when I want, let's say, if I go to a dentist and a researcher and start talking about the strength of a bridge. And the material, let's say that if I if I have let's say the healthy tooth and I add here a bridge, and then I need to connect this bridge with uh, small beams and glue it, and then I apply a load here. What is the section of this beam? How is it calculated? This is how it's calculated. They know nothing about it because it's not their field of expertise, right? Physicians have a different type of training. And of course, mechanics of materials and the calculations is not a part of their curriculum. Trust me, I know uh, about that. And therefore, this is how bioengineering, the bioengineering field emerged. And who went to save the day? Civil engineers, as usual. And of course, after civil engineers spread uh, the knowledge and other fields like mechanical engineers started using the finite element method. Uh, mechanical engineers also perform this type of analysis, but again, their understanding of uh, mechanics and the mechanics of structures is not as high as ours because we are all about how this structure is going to behave. Yeah, we start with columns, beams, and so on and so on. But as you evolve, then eventually you understand that there is nothing around us that does not behave uh, according to what we've learned so far, right? Boundary conditions, supports, and external forces, and mechanics of materials, behavior of materials. That's it. And then you can enter the world of modeling motorbikes, cars, Aeroplanes, my thesis, my Scripsy, my Scripsy uh, project was uh, the modeling of an agar wind through a fluid structure interaction uh, model. And the, I, I contributed to the development of the updating of the mesh of the fluid through the torsional, uh, the torsional 
uh, spring analogy method, and then I've developed my orthosemi torsional spring analogy method, which was got published at the computer methods in uh, um, engineering mechanics, or what's the name, the Kukmame, in mechanics engineering, uh, computer methods in mechanical engineering. Kumame is the best uh, and highest cited uh, journal um, in computational mechanics uh, to date. And I was a civil engineer. So some future work. Uh, the, this is a model, by the way, in nuclear uh, reactor building new scale, a small modular reactor building that we were investigating with a colleague of mine uh, who is now in Canada. 30 meters by 75 meters is the plan view. The height is around uh, 40 meters. Three quarters of the structure is underground. You have the reactor pool, the spent fuel storage, and here is the area where the small modular reactors are positioned. The developers claim 100% clean energy. It doesn't produce any waste. And as you can see, scalable. I can start with one nuclear reactor, which is a cylinder of three meters in diameter and 20 meters tall, which is submerged in water, which is 25 meters deep. And we can start producing electricity, and then we can add another one and another one. You usually these small modular reactors are 50 megawatt each. So if I add 12, I have a 600 megawatt reactor building. And uh, definitely, our goal here was not to investigate the nuclear part of this uh, factory, even though Filippo Genko. Uh, was a nuclear and is a nuclear engineer. He's a mechanical and a nuclear engineer at the same time. But I investigated the uh, seismic resistance of this structure for the largest ever recorded earthquake. And we developed this model. As you can see, these are the embedded rivers and the development, the formation of the concrete domain. This model had 2,703,400 uh, embedded rivers. And uh, 181,076 hexahedral elements. Now, of course, the idea here is how big can we go? Can we go bigger? Can we perform a dynamic analysis instead of just a pushover analysis? Uh, do you know this building? Have you ever been there? Right, this is Burj Khalifa, tallest building in the world, 828 meters. Tall. Uh, I visited a couple of times, a couple many times, when I was in Abu Dhabi for six years, and uh, definitely a very interesting building, which will uh, definitely also not be the tallest building in the world for a long time. And as you can see, this is the closer look, and this is a closer look of the foundation and the ground floor. As you can see, I used. Uh, this is a model that I've developed, by the way. And this is me, and this is the thickness and the height of the pile cab and the foundation. Piles were not included. And in order to develop this model, I used 14,462,798 hexahedral elements. I did not develop the uh, reinforcement mesh for um, <laughs> obvious reasons. And the number of nodes was, were 22 million, 7,002. And of course, if you include the soil and the pies and perform a soil structure interaction analysis, then definitely things will become uh, way more difficult. So the idea is to develop uh, parallel processing algorithms that will be able through the use of supercomputers to allow us to perform this type of analysis. And Definitely, this is something that we're working on. Uh, we need to integrate with more materials uh, for uh, the soil and perform soil structure interaction investigations. So far, we have the Rambo Rosewood model, and uh, we need to have a model for sand. So, if, if anyone uh, is interested, we are looking for somebody that will do that, even though we have a candidate already. But we can also have more models, uh, porous pressure, taking into consideration liquefaction and so on. Now, my image says, prof, to develop the reinforcement mesh, um, you would have to ensure the reinforcement mesh, right? 
uh, you have to assume the reinforcement measure since you don't have the reward drawing. Uh, yeah, if you don't have it, you have to assume it. But if you assume like a 2% reinforcement ratio, then definitely you will be very close to what they have there. Uh, even 3% is a lot, but it's high strength concrete and you can do it. But imagine how long it will take to do that. It will be mad madness. The difficult part is constructing it and not assuming or getting it from the technical drawings for the Bush Khalifa. Okay. And of course, uh, we are extending our research in AI. And every year we have new results, new data sets, new models. And this is a very, very interesting and catchy uh, subject that has a lot of uh, unresolved problems. We are working now also with uh, uh, Elvis that is developing the uh, predictive model uh, of for deflection of curved steel I beams, which there is no uh, there is no solution and there is no predictive model in any design uh, code in the world. Thank you so much. And I'm ready to receive your questions, if you have any. Something that you would like to discuss a bit more. Something that doesn't make sense. All right, Johan says, thanks for the interesting presentation, Pro. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes left. If you would like to discuss about something, ask about something, about the modeling, more technical question maybe. Definitely it's difficult to follow because I showed you a modeling of cyclic modeling, of dynamic modeling. All these things are way more advanced than what you've seen so far during your academic career as students. Uh, and your studies, but uh, this is uh, where you separate easy and difficult. I like when I when we see design of reinforced concrete structures under static loads, like you say, th this is kindergarten level, and that's why you should have that knowledge and the theory, understand really well what design of each and every. Uh, material for C's and E's and what's the actual expected physical response and mechanical response of our structure and then connect it with modeling and then you have to understand how modeling works, what are the limitations. This is the reason why you need to have a very deep view, a good view, an understanding of the finite element method, linear and non-linear analysis and then bind everything together in order to bring yourself into the position where you'll be able to decide the best approach of modeling something and understand the restrictions and restraints of that uh, model and have them in mind when you get the results in order to say, ah, this is stiffer than the real life, so I should do this, this, and that. So these are crucial when we perform, especially when we perform evaluation and assessment of our structures. Now, Dylan wrote, is the start of the lecture, you mentioned that we can model wind turbine. Uh, ah, bravo. I didn't show you any. Uh, this is uh, okay, something that can be solved really fast. And he says also, does this include the rotation of the wind turbine and associate forces? Also, can we model the flow where uh, or even fluid flowing uh, through the turbine? Yes, we can. This is something that is actually done, fluid structure interaction. And what we did though, we modeled the soil, the foundation and the tower, and we uh, just added the blades and the rotor, the engine as a mass, and we perform model analysis and pushover analysis, and we investigated butter uh, piles, pile foundation with inclinations and vertical, and we found that 10 degrees is the best inclination. But there are scientists that they actually create models that uh, investigate the aerodynamics of the wind turbine structures. And the answer to your question is yes, yes, and absolutely yes. 
for the dynamic analysis, Bruno says, do you think we will use AI to design uh, or use AI to fine tune the formula and keep using simpler methods? Uh, for now, developing formula is in the developmental stage. Uh, there, uh, there is a lot of work to be done. And um, uh, when we perform dynamic analysis, it's an advanced type of analysis and you need advanced knowledge to assess and evaluate the results. This is the, the difficult part. You have difficulty of developing the model and make sure that the model is objective and realistic and error free, and then get the results and start evaluating them and then uh, assess and pr propose solutions and recommendations. And this is the reason why we have the quasi-static analysis, which we've learned in our SIN 778 course and class, right? Where we calculate the quasi-static load and seismic load by using the, the response spectrum diagram. So we convert the dynamic problem into an equivalent quasi-static problem to apply just the horizontal load, which is the maximum expected horizontal load, according to the type of our structure, is dynamic response and behavior and characteristics, and of course, the maximum expected ground acceleration. So AI is coming there in order to give us some solutions in deriving uh, results in terms of deriving and constructing formulae that will be able to predict a specific characteristic of the structure. But yes, I believe in the future, we'll be able to develop an AI-based software that will be able to see the geometry and the material properties of a structure. And in a millisecond, we'll be able to provide you with how it will behave if it's loaded uh, like this under dynamic loading conditions or um, monotonic loading conditions, but this is going to need uh, a lot of work, a lot of work. Johan says, do you think FAIR will ever reach a point where it replaces traditional design codes? It already does, Johan, in design codes, they tell you, if you don't use this, use a nonlinear analysis. That's it, it's as far as the code goes. And we already, the, 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 your question should have been, which is a more interesting question, will FAIR replace actual experiments? Now, this is a good question. Partially, it has done so, but there is a lot of work to be done in more, more uh, difficult problems. And if you want to take into consideration now, uh, temperature change, creep, shrinkage phenomena, uh, fire, and, um, if you take into consideration uh, more, uh, let's say more uh, complicated uh, mechanism that occur within a reinforced concrete structure and also the interaction between uh, the reinforcement and concrete domain, micro cracking, uh, what about also freeze and thaw phenomena? If you want to go um, as deep as nature, there's a lot of work to be done. Johan is happy. Okay. Just let me see, uh, just to um, find uh, the work that was done by DWALT really fast. And we presented it in um, uh, Comdin uh, 2019. No. Um, well, the, okay, I will, uh, let's go here and go to what uh, the world's, um, script work. So I'll have a presentation here, poster info, content three scripts function fine white uh, let me see okay should be this one okay uh, he did a lot of work in the fundamental period of structures this is the soil structure interaction uh, and uh, as oscillation based on the 
second fundamental mode as it resulted, then validation of cell structure interaction. And this is the model um, that we created, right? And the different uh, piles, uh, Dylan, who asked about uh, wind turbine structures. Um, and of course, uh, this, uh, as you can see, are the fundamental uh, modes and periods of a, a specific model. And this is a pushover analysis, so it's a train traction. Here, by the way, the soil was removed just to be able to see the, the formation of the piles and the stress development within the soil and concrete, as you can see, is pretty uh, interesting. And uh, this is, these are the results from the pushover that we got for the 10 degrees uh, configuration as it resulted from recon and fair um, nonlinear analysis. All right, 20 past two, let us have a 10 minute break. And uh, for my students, uh, I'll see you in scene 778 in 10 minutes. For the rest, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.